welcome to this episode of the Counterculture Podcast. Um, we've been talking for about the last 30 minutes, and I think this one's really going to be a doozy. Uh, we're going to jump in and discuss probably half of this chapter, or as much as we can get through in the time we have, and then whatever we don't cover, we'll cover probably next week. Um, but I'm Josh Hill. I uh, am here with John Wiggins, Alex Cowan, and uh, today we'll be looking at chapter 8 in Counterculture, the Gospel and Ethnicity. So, uh, yeah, we'll just, we'll just kick it off. Um, we, we agree on the vast majority of things, right, um, with regards to reading this chapter. That's what we've spent the last 30 minutes talking about. Um, well, where we disagree, you know, we're going to be able to talk through that. So let's just start kind of walking through everything and see see where we're at. Um, I appreciate that his, you know, he started out with the story of the um, 16th Street Baptist Church bombing, you know, um, for Platt in particular, and also for us just because of our proximity. Um, it's close to home, right? Mm-hmm. We see racism happen in a generation that is still alive today, you know, and that close to our backyard. So clearly we can't be completely divorced Mm -hmm. from the issues that this particular chapter surrounds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Yeah, I I actually enjoyed reading what uh, King said in this letter, Uh, you know, kind of, um, you know, spoke to some areas of of racism that I didn't, that I, you know, I didn't think about necessarily uh, in terms that, um, of things that um, have been experienced by African Americans, you know, um, and I think he ends it with a great, a great ending. He says, there comes a time when the cup of endurance runs over, men are no longer willing to be plunged into an abyss of injustice. And, and that's the case. I mean, mm-hmm. uh, there, there is a breaking point, you know, for, uh, in the sense that, um, you know, uh, I read something. You read, read, read what he said here. I mean, look. You think about uh, the, what he what he indicted the pastors with, you know, like the yeah, in yeah. the midst of blatant injustices inflicted upon the Negro. I have watched white churches stand on the sideline and merely mouth pious irrelevancies and sanctimonious trivialities. In the midst of a mighty struggle to rid our nation of racial and economic injustice, I've heard so many ministers say. Those are social issues with which the gospel has no real concern. I mean, that was happening in the 60s. It's yeah. still happening today. You have people standing up and go, well, you know, the gospel doesn't speak to that, so we're not going to speak to that. Mm-hmm. And that just is heartbreaking and maddening, if I'm being entirely the, honest. The thing yeah. with sin is it never causes anything good. Mm-hmm. Like, bitterness leads to more bitterness. Yeah. And actually, if you, read, if you read what uh, King is describing here, is how the sin of the racism from the white people to the black pe- people, he even says of his own children there, is developing bitterness in their hearts towards white people. Yeah, that was and the part this that I thought. cyclical um, <clears throat> effect of sin where you're starting to breed bitterness between two groups of people. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the, the fun town was, it, it hurt me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like for those kids, the, not be allowed to enter into, I guess, was a theme park or something, you know. Um, uh, and, you know, it's just one of many, but tears in the eyes of children are heavy, you know, uh, on my heart, you know. And so, it's, and this, this quote that he has on the next page, you know, is again, Dr. King. There was a time when the church was very powerful. It was during that period when the early Christians rejoiced when they were deemed worthy to suffer for what they believed. In those days, the church was not merely a thermometer that recorded the ideas and principles of popular opinion. It was a thermostat that transformed the mores of society. But the judgment of God is upon the church as never before. If the church of today does not recapture the sacrificial spirit of the early church, it will lose its authentic ring, forfeit the loyalty of millions, and be dismissed as an irrelevant social club with no meaning for the 20th century. Why did so many godly men that we respect miss this? It's a great question because, because, because we, future generations, can look back at us and go, why did my granddad see that? Yeah. yeah. Why was it? And so, well, why do we think that this is so obvious to us, but for many godly men at the time it wasn't? Well, again, I think it's, you know, <clears throat> it's, it's so cultural, right? Mm-hmm. You have what boils down to hundreds and hundreds of years of the 
subjection of black people to horrors and atrocities uh, to the point that it becomes culturally normal. Yes. And when you're growing up and these things are normalized to the point of dehumanization, um, it's much harder to break out of a cultural norm than it is to start a new one, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. So I'm certain that we have blind spots in the same way. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I feel woefully inadequate to be able to discuss race in the United States as a, as a blonde haired, blue eyed yeah. white man. And we, we always like to think that if we lived back then that we'd be different. Right. The point I'm trying to make is we wouldn't. We might often have not been different. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I think so. You know, I, I uh, um, yeah, I think, I think he makes it abundantly clear that, um, uh, these, this was an atrocity, you know, these were, this is, this is terrible things that were, were happening in Birmingham. Uh, like you said, our backyard, uh, you know, not too far away. And, uh, um, the ones he mentions, obviously, or just restricted in Birmingham, but, but, um, uh, but, but then he kind of, he's going to move to sort of uh, begin to say um, uh, what the Bible says, you know, in this next part, really on 190, talking about uh, a starting point. Um, he says, consider the starting point of the gospel for so many of the social issues we have addressed, the creation of man and woman, in the image of God with equal dignity before God. Uh, as we've seen, this means that no human being is more or less human than another. Mm -hmm. And that really, I mean, a large part of what yeah. the problem was is, the de like you said, dehumanization yeah. of humans. I mean, it was, it was, that's, you know, that, that was something that was a blind spot. Even when you go me. back to the founding of this country, you know, it was a compromise moving up a positive compromise that black people were considered to be three-fifths of a person. Like, it was... Right, right. Yeah. Nobody wanted, right. you know, the Southerners wanted them to be counted as a full person so they would get more money based on the amount of yes. slaves that they had from the government. And the Northerners didn't want them to be counted as a person at all in the census because of they didn't have as many slaves as the South did. But so three-fifths of a person was considered ideal. Right. You know, a group of, of Anglo-American people looked at that and said, mm -hmm. that's fine. Yeah. <laughs> Which, that's well, so fine. <laughs> the, the same nature is um, within all of us, regardless of race. <clears throat> you think of Scotland, where I'm from, all white people. And it's the Catholics and the Protestants with each other. You go to Germany in the, the 40s and they're gassing the Jews, they're all white people. They're all killing each other. Um, Spend time in Rwanda, you go to Rwanda, the Rwandan genocide. There's the Hutus and the Tutsis killing each other, killing a million people in three months. They're all black. Yeah. Um, as humans, we seem to always find a way to um, make that distinction between us and the other. And if it's the same skin color, it's going to be some other thing that we're going to hate. Well, they live on that side of the country, or we've got this thing about always hating the other person. Mm -hmm. And uh, in America, you know, the distinction is skin color. Because it's not normal to live in a country with people with all these different skin colors. Mm -hmm. That's not normal. If you go to countries in the world, usually it's mostly one skin color. Um, but in America, that's the big distinction. And um, we see that play out through racial terms in America. So just as a, as a real, world, real world example, mm -hmm. Alex, you grew up in Scotland. Mm -hmm. How old were you? Do you remember how old you were the first time you ever saw a black person? Probably, you know, maybe 10 or something like that. So ten, I, 10 years of my, the first time my sister saw a black person and um, she went up to him and there was only one, she'd never seen a black person before, there was only one black person on television. So she thought, well, it must be him. Cause there's only one. She only thought there was one in the whole world. <laughs> and she went up to him and said, excuse me, are you the black man off the television? And he was like, no. <laughs> so it's a very different cultural context. Very different cultural, but if you go to Scotland, we still have problems with hating the other. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Fist fights with the Catholics, right? Yeah, right across from my school was a Catholic school. It's yeah. a Catholic school. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I think Plaid is, is going to uh, deal with this. Uh, 
Um, in the first few, he says, um, uh, dealing with the, the issue of ethnicity as opposed to particular, particularly having to do with skin color uh, is his, his goal here, it seems, at the, at the beginning. Um, uh, he says, for example, God doesn't equate membership in the human race with skin tone. Uh, whatever color Adam and Eve were, they contained in them a DNA designed by God that would eventually develop into a multicolored family across a multicultural world. Um, he, he is, um, <clears throat> in, in a sense, showing um, you know, that all of this starts with Adam and Eve uh, and that um, uh, the Bible storyline is, is talking about a basic unity between, uh, behind worldly diversity because it begins with Adam and Eve, and uh, and so I think that, that, you know absolutely his point is spot on, no question. But I think it's easy for us because we've seen it done for so long to equate common ancestry with common experience, and when we do that, we can sell short often the struggles of uh, the other. You know, you talk about how we have this tendency to hate the other, right? But you know, often I've seen in, in my own experience, um, if we can just tie people back to the starting point and go, well, everybody's the same, you know, everybody's got the same starting point, everybody's, it's easier to write off where we're different and to not have to deal with those things that come out of the, the not shared experiences. Does that make sense? I, I, there's nothing wrong with being reminded of the fact that we are have a common ancestry. And I think it's, that's right and that's good for us to know with regards to the human race. Absolutely, we're all a human race. But for us to say that that means that our experiences are often the same or can be all traced back to the same thing, I think it's a bit of a stretch for me. Yeah, but I think Platt's main point he's trying to make with common ancestry is, is, is uh, um, another, um, another piece of evidence that we're all created equal. Yes. That we're all come back to the same starting point uh, um, from the same... You know, equal dignity. Equal dignity. Um, equally equal dignity. Equally the image of God. Value. Yeah. Yeah. Equal value. Yeah. And, and, if, and that's that's. I think that. Yeah. That's why he starts it. The, the theology behind it is is that is that the creation of of man and woman and their um, uh, unique value and dignity um, is what he's trying to establish from the beginning and, and really where the conversation he, he says is most helpful to start uh, is is kind of what he's I think telling us that it locates. The category of race, as we commonly use it, is, is he says on page 192, is unhelpful because it locates identity and physical appearance. Um, and <clears throat> while we while we don't want to diminish the history of our culture, um, because ours ours like you like you said, I mean there's there's lots of different racism and hate, mm -hmm. you know, uh, it, that has been experienced by different peoples. Some some sometimes same colors, different, sometimes different, but. Um, here in our context, in America, it was it was largely divided between race, right? Uh, between color, skin color, <laughs> uh, physical appearance, um, and so you know it. it uh, um, but it all has its grassroots in what we know about the dignity of man and woman, and that they were created equal and valuable. You yeah, know? I, I mean, he also when we talk about talking about come from the same race, that starting point with Adam and Eve. He's talking about it to you know emphasize the equal value, dignity, being equal in the image of God. Then the last sentence is there, as you set it up there, is it, fundamentally we are all part of the same race. That's why we all need the same gospel. Right. right. Yeah. And that's what he's doing. He's setting up the problem. Yeah, sure. And the, and the gospel perspective is the one that is important to keep central, right? Because regardless of our personal struggles, regardless of the difficult things that we have to deal with, whether we are black or white, or, you know, whether our ethnicity is Rwandan mm -hmm. or uh, English or Germanic or whatever, um, everyone that is born is born into sin. That's fundamentally what we believe. And we believe that Jesus, in his perfect life, death, burial, and resurrection, provided a way to save everyone, mm -hmm. no matter what our experience is. Mm -hmm. And with that, we are out of time. So we're going to jump back into this same chapter uh, again next week. Uh, so hang with us. And um, if you have any questions about anything we've already talked about, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, but until next week, we love you and we'll pray for you.